Good afternoon and welcome. Um, I call this meeting of the Committee of Workforce and Business Development Finance and Policy to order. Members, please mute your mics and we will get started. Uh, having said that, uh, this meeting, uh, this remote meeting hearing is conducted pursuant to Rule 10.01. Also, this remote hearing can be viewed on house television. I assume today uh, it's going to be HTV4. Uh, having said that, um, the committee legislative assistant will take the role for attendance. Jason, uh, please. Nor. Present. Jason. Jason. Hamilton. And Representative Hamilton was having trouble with his mic, so we might want to have to send him the actual number so he can call on his cell phone. Baker? Baker? Davney? Davney? Frankie? Present. Greenman? Present. Haley? Haley, Jurgens, Jurgens, Kegel, here. Katiza Watoon, present. Olson, present. Tujong, present. Jejong. Hamilton, Baker, Davney, Haley, Jurgens, present. We are at quorum. Thank you, uh, Jason Chavez. Uh, there's a quorum present. Members, um, I assume uh, Representative um, Vice Chair Jean has reviewed the minutes and will be making a motion to approve the minutes. I think he's having uh, difficulty with his uh, mic today. Uh, I welcome uh, members. Uh, I'm sure you have reviewed the minutes. Uh, you Mr. have it in Chair, the I move the minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Olson. Uh, moves the minutes for January 11th. And uh, just wanted to make sure that uh, for those who are in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. Uh, the minutes for January 11th has been adopted. Uh, thank you so much uh, members uh, for all of you who are joining uh, right now. I just wanted to say that we are fortunate enough today to have the commissioner for DEED, uh, Steve Grove, uh, commissioner for Department of Employment and Economic Development. Uh, we will be going through overview of the department. I know we have uh, lots of questions and we wanna make sure that we get to your questions. So if it's a technical question, please raise your hand immediately. But if you can wait until uh, the commissioner and his team are done with the presentation, that will be the best way that we can get done. And so we can learn about the department and some of the issues that we may have, we, you can always uh, connect with the department. So uh, having said that, I just wanted to welcome uh, Commissioner Grove to Workforce and Business Development uh, Committee. Welcome Commissioner, and you may start the presentation. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Steve Grove, I'm the uh, Commissioner of the Department of Employment and Economic Development, and thrilled to get the chance to talk with you today about the work of DEED and the work we have ahead of us together. Uh, I am joined today by the Deputy Commissioner for Economic Development and Research, Kevin McKinnon, our Deputy Commissioner for Workforce Development, Hamza Warfa, our Deputy Commissioner for Workforce Services, Blake Chafee, and our Assistant Commissioner for Operations, Evan Rowe. You hear all from all of them in a little bit. Um, but before again, I just wanted to 
begin with a note of gratitude to all of you for your hard work over this last year. It has been uh, an extraordinary year, and we've been in touch with, with so many of you on a very regular basis. Representative Noor and I are on, on speed dial at this point. Uh, so many of you others have visited your districts, been able to get in touch with you and your constituents. Uh, your leadership and your hard work over this last year have been essential to keeping our economy going at an incredibly difficult time. And whether that's been surfacing individual uh, concerns on unemployment insurance from a constituent or helping a small business navigate uh, aid programs at the state or federal level, um, time and again, all of you have shown up and helped our state uh, manage this crisis in a way that um, really just a testament to your leadership. So we feel very fortunate um, as a department to be working with all of you. I will say when the committee assignments came out and we saw the legislators in this committee, we were thrilled. Uh, this is really a group of thoughtful leaders um, and we're excited uh, for the work ahead. Uh, you know, I want to say that obviously we're at a time over the last year where there's been a lot of talk of division. And certainly in the last week, uh, a, a really heightened amount of rhetoric around division. Um, but this committee and our relationship uh, and, and Minnesota's way of doing things does not have division at its center. It really has collaboration at its center. And when you look at, for example, the, the $216 million aid package that we collaborated on just last December, you know, Republicans and Democrats, House, Senate, the governor's office, obviously deed and revenue, um, that was just one great example of the fact that when it comes to growing our state's economy, you know, there's no, uh, there's no left and right. There's just how do we create the best levers possible to grow uh, this uh, state's economy because it is a great state economy um, and it, it needs government to be a solid partner in that effort. So we come into this session just with a, an attitude of, of gratitude and also of collaboration. I want to thank you all for, for pushing this department to be better too. You know, I think um, the, 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 the criticisms and, and concerns and, and issues that you raised to us, they make our department better, they make me better as a commissioner. And so we welcome that and we really appreciate it. And um, we are excited for, for more of that to come and, and for just a great legislative session. So, you know, really the purpose of today is just to ground us all in what is the work of DEED? What is it that your Department of Employment and Economic Development actually does? Um, many of you have been around for some time, so you have a, a good sense of this. Others are newer, so this will maybe be a lot more new information. But I'll say that even just in the last uh, year or so, we have changed a decent amount of our approach to really try to deliver uh, at a better level for Minnesotans. So as we begin to go through the slides here, um, we'll walk through some of the details of, of the what, but as much as, as we want to talk about the what, we'll also talk about um, the how. So um, I, I can't see the slide deck up right now, but is it present to all of you? Can you see the slides on your screen? Why don't we, why don't we project it? I think Daryl Dannon, our legislative director, is going to do that. Daryl, do you have those? Okay, I thought I was sharing. Um, so it was, and then it. Sure, okay. Commissioner, this is Travis. We we turned the slides off because that was the only thing that House TV gotcha. was able to see. So if Daryl wants to go ahead and share them again, um, it'll be front and center again. All right, hold on then. Thank All you, right. Travis. This is what happens when I plan ahead, Travis. I'm teasing you. All right, hold on. We'll share it again. No worries. All right. There we go. There we okay. go. Good. Well, again, we're going to walk through just an overview of the department, and then we're going to go a little bit deeper into COVID-19 response, just since obviously that's something that is on everyone's minds. Um, so I guess just to get us started, when this administration came into DEED a couple of years ago, um, we were really blessed to get to work with an amazing agency filled with extremely competent and passionate professionals. And we heard from them and from many of you and from stakeholders that DEED itself needed kind of a refresh in its approach and um, more focus on a kind of mission-driven agency and one that really put our customers at the center of everything that we do. And so one of the first things we did when we came in is just re-examine what our mission statement is. Uh, and our mission statement is really quite simple. Uh, it's to empower the growth of the Minnesota economy for everyone. And obviously, it's the workers and businesses of our state that grow this incredible economy that we get to uh, be a part of. But government plays a role in empowering that economy, and we have to do it for every last Minnesotan. So this is a mission statement that is simple, but it is a refreshed look at just why DEED exists as an agency. And then we also took some time working with uh, members of our team and employees across DEED to do kind of a bottoms-up examination of 
of how we wanted to run the agency. What are the, what are the values that inhibit uh, the kind of work that we want to do for businesses and, and people? And so we came together through a collaborative process on really six values that guide the work of this agency. Um, they are focus on the customer, communicate early and often, uh, seek solutions, be in that orientation of seeking solutions to problems, uh, create inclusion across everything we do. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, encourage new ideas and to be gracious. Um, these are of course just words on a paper, but I share them here because they really are part of how we do our work indeed. Um, every month we hold a town hall and we lift up examples of individual employees or teams that have exhibited these values. Uh, we've instituted a new annual award system internally. No money involved, just recognition, but we award uh, employees who have really living up to these values in truly unique ways or teams that have really grabbed hold of these values and seen that live out uh, in their work today. And so um, we, we wanna be living in a values driven agency, one that again, focuses on customers and, and does our work well. And these values are a big part of, of that strategy. Um, if you go to the next slide, I think um, just to give you the most basic overview of what DEED does, we are your workforce development and economic development agency. Now, in many states, those two agencies are separate agencies. You have a sort of a workforce agency and an economic development agency. DEED actually encapsulates both. And we think that's a really great approach because it involves, puts both workers and businesses in the same proximity. And because in many ways, they're both they're, they're the same or different sides of the same coin in terms of uh, employers ser searching for workers and worker workers searching for jobs, that kind of synergy is something that we think is the right arrangement for our state government. Um, on the business side, obviously, we are working to attract and retain and expand businesses and create great jobs for all Minnesotans. And on our workforce, we want uh, Minnesotans to find and prepare for jobs in great industries that have a long-term trajectory and to help people live independently uh, without the need for government assistance, where a job is what sustains them and their families. And um, as you dig into DEED more deeply, you'll see it's a pretty diverse agency. And, it, and I say that in terms of just Functionally, um, the agency looks at almost every experience that a worker could have, and it has, has a division that sort of covers that, whether it's unemployment insurance or state services for the blind or, uh, or startup programs for new companies. It, it really captures a, a broad spectrum of issues that both workers and businesses face, and that diversity in our approach is really one of the strengths uh, of the agency. Um, so it's important, uh, and then here are the divisions. Let me go through this just for a moment. Um, these are kind of the broadest divisions that you can use to explain what DEED does. And in a moment, I'll ask each of our, our deputy commissioners to walk through these in more detail. Um, but we have workforce development, workforce services, economic development, and general support services. Um, previously, DEED had workforce development as one entire uh, division, but that was really about 90% of the agency in one division. And workforce development, which is focused on, on building and growing those jobs for, for job seekers, had a distinct enough uh, sort of contour to it and workforce services, which helps in a lot of ways with some of the social safety nets or on-ramp programs to those who maybe need more help in, in being in a job seeking orientation made sense as kind of two separate divisions. And we'll walk through that uh, in a little bit. But beyond just the, the, the what of, of what DEED does is, is the how we're running the agency. And so uh, one of the things that um, we have done is really hone in on um, a system by which we can measure our progress over time. And uh, one of those things is objectives and key results. This is a system uh, that is used by companies across the world and increasingly more governments that sets really aspirational goals um, and then has key metrics that are used to measure success against those goals that we can track quarter over quarter. Uh, and that kind of combination of aspirational goals that stretch us and then a way to measure them through a metrics driven approach is how we've begun to run our agency. So every quarter we look at a whole host of, of objectives and key results across all of our programs. Uh, we track our progress through quantifiable results. Um, every single department at the agency um, sets goals that, that ladder up to the, the agency wide goals and then we grade them. The scale you can see here, um, we're not trying to get 1.0 on every grade. Um, that would mean we set our goals too low. Uh, we're certainly not trying to get 0, 0.0. That means we set our goals too high. Kind of the sweet spot is like 0. 0.6 or 0. 0.7 or so. It means we've stretched ourselves to achieve something better than we otherwise would. Again, rooted in the statutes that guide us, rooted in uh, the programs and, and divisions that you've all built for us to, to run, but really focused on results. And I think this kind of performance-driven management is an important part of, of how we run the agency. 
Um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see the objectives and key results we've set for this year. Again, trying to root the broadest themes possible for our agency and the problems of our moment and the challenges and opportunities that they, they give us. Uh, the first objective is to radically increase deeds economic impact for individuals and businesses that face systematic barriers to growth. So every single team at Deed has an objective and a measurable result against that uh, goal. The second goal is economic revitalization, which is to galvanize an economic recovery that advances Minnesota's labor market, businesses, and communities for the next Minnesota economy. This is really the, the, the rebirth of the reimagination of our economy in this coming year. Again, every program area has goals that stretch us towards that aspirational one. And then the third is really focused on culture, building a positive internal culture that makes DEED uh, an extraordinary place to work. And we talked about culture a moment ago, but again, the whole point of even focusing on culture is that we wanna have an agency that delivers for Minnesotans. And if people internally at DEED are operating effectively, efficiently, if there's a sense of camaraderie and belief in what we're doing, we're gonna be better uh, as an agency for the rest of the state. So these are again, the three kind of broad goals that as a, from an operational standpoint, really drive the, the work of our agency and, and every single team uh, ladders up into those uh, in ways that, um, that we think kind of gets everyone uh, rowing in the same direction. Um, as part of that work, um, we want to make sure that we're just running the most effective agency possible for Minnesotans and for businesses. So we've done a couple of things that I just wanted to highlight here. This isn't an exhaustive list, but it just gives you a sense of kind of the, the feeling in the air at Deed and how we're, we're running the agency at this unique time. One is that we've created an innovation lab, an opportunity for people to bring new ideas um, or challenges they focus on and using a human-centered design approach to get to solutions. So we've brought in experts from the University of Minnesota, from other state governments who've done uh, innovation labs before to really uh, guide us on a journey of how to build that effort internally at our agency. And we just got this started sort of middle of last year. Already some great projects have come together around people who've come to the lab on improving services for, for our career force work, on improving some internal processes that we think are gonna save taxpayer dollars. It's just a nice area to have where you know, not everything in government you can innovate on because you've got to deliver and you can't experiment and fail in something that a life depends on. But there are a lot of areas inside of a government agency where you can innovate and where innovation is possible and in fact necessary and, and our taxpayers and our constituents deserve it. We want to build that kind of culture, that kind of muscle internally that will make DEED a more effective agency. So that's been a, a good development and we'll continue to update you on, on how that unfolds. Um, again, we're focused on a really performance driven agency um, not just in the objectives and OKRs for our programs, which I spoke about, but also just in the outcomes of the programs uh, publicly and, and the transparent decision making that exists around them. So, you know, what are the metrics for a workforce program that, that are fair and standard across all organizations? What are the, the key metrics for economic development program that are critical to our success? That kind of culture of, of looking at the data to determine effectiveness and then making decisions based on that data is something that is central to what we're doing. Um, we reinvented our Office of Economic Opportunity. This is a critical office that serves as a bridge between DEED and communities all across the state. You hear more about this from Deputy Commissioner Hamza Warfa in a moment, but this was a huge area of growth for us. Um, when you consider the hundreds of millions of dollars that DEED pumps into our economy every year, you got an awareness issue. You got, a, you got a access to information problem. You wanna make sure that every business, every person in the state knows what's available it is not just those kind of on the inside know-how track that are coming for that money every time that it's available. And that takes us being proactive. And it's not enough just to post a link on a website and call it good or chuck a tweet out and figure you're done. You gotta get out in the community. And, and that is what that office has been set up to do. Many of you have helped us get that right. Um, we are excited about it. And you'll hear more about that again a little bit later. And then I think just lastly, you know, we are significantly streamlining a lot of the processes in our agency uh, to make it work faster. Uh, more transparent and just be less bureaucratic. And, and we'll walk through some of the results of that uh, in a moment, but we've taken a look at, for example, our grant making process to make that much more efficient and effective. And Deputy Commissioner Warfer will go into some of the details on that later. So um, these are some, some important parts of building an effective agency. Um, I do wanna back up just for a second because I think I missed the budget slide, which may be the most important one back on slide six. Thanks, Darielle. Um, uh, we can go into more depth on this as needed, but I just wanna highlight kind of how we're structured from a financial standpoint, because of course budgets show you where your, where your attention ends up being. And one thing just to note for everybody here is that DEED gets a lot of federal funding. In fact, more than half of our funding at DEED 
comes from the federal government. And really primarily that's in workforce because the federal government has a strong interest in, in growing a strong workforce in our country. Um, but it's just important to know in terms of how we're, how we're structured. Um, these are all the divisions. I won't go into each, but I'll just highlight the top four divisions from a budgetary standpoint are employment and training programs, uh, vocational rehabilitation services, uh, business and community development, and our unemployment insurance program. And you'll hear more about each of those programs in a little bit. Um, so before I turn it over for a deeper dive in each of our areas, I just want to take a moment to recognize the fact that we live in a really remarkable economy. And I'm sure every state's economic development director and you know wants to say that, but we can say that in this state with a great deal of confidence. We're fortunate. You know, we are the, the state and the country that if you start a business, you are more likely to be around five years from now than any other state in the country. This is the best state in the country for business survivability. People who start stuff here, they stick to it. Like they believe in the business they've built and they make it happen. Um, we are the first in Fortune 500 companies per capita among the top 30 metro areas of the Twin Cities and fourth per capita in Minnesota. Um, I'd heard a lot about, uh, you know, the, the sort of the metro area of Fortune 500 when I came back from the Silicon Valley a couple of years ago to my home state, but I didn't know as much about the fact that greater Minnesota had such a great number of Fortune 500s, fourth per capita, across the entire state. This is a huge blessing. Um, we are the best state in the country for families. We're the least stressed state. Um, we're always in the top rankings for happiness. I think we're number number two or three this year behind Hawaii and Utah, but we'll, we'll get them someday, maybe if the weather gets a little better. Um, but that's a huge value for us. We're the fourth best state in the country for education, fourth in labor force participation. Again, this is a hard working state. People wanna to get to work. We're at over almost 68% labor force participation right now. That's been traditionally high. Uh, and we're the 10th most economically diverse state as it relates to kind of industry sectors, which is a huge strength, particularly in recessions, because when recessions hit, the more diverse economies can weather that hit based on the fact that they have a lot of different directions uh, to go. So we do uh, sit on top of an economy that's really fortunate, and we've got to do the best we can to make it a great economy moving forward. And so just a couple of thoughts quickly on economic recovery before we dive into the uh, more details on deed. We've begun to think about some of the principles that should guide our journey ahead for this recovery that we're going to have to engage in with all of you and the rest of Minnesota in the coming year. And these are some of the principles that I just want to put out there is that are on our mind. Obviously, you'll hear later from this month from the governor how, how our budget um, you know, will hit on many of these points. But I want to just highlight some of the themes now. First is just to start with equity. We know this crisis has disproportionately impacted communities of color, not just in a public health perspective, but also from an unemployment perspective and a small business perspective. And so anything we do in this recovery has to start with equity as the primary principle. Um, and I say this from a position of, of privilege being a, a white man leading this agency. This is something that, um, that my ears need to be continually open to and I need to be continually in dialogue with community about because it is the most important principle going forward. Um, second, I would say safely opening our state. We can certainly talk about that at length if it's useful here, um, but um, we wanna keep opening up the state further um, and, and getting our economy back up and running and getting that consumer confidence up such that when it is open, people are out there engaging in our hospitality industry in particular as the virus gets to be in a better shape. Reskilling is a major focus because look, you know, this recession has not been your typical recession. It is focused primarily on the service sector and hospitality. And so given that specific focus on, on an industry type, we need to be thinking about reskilling as that, as that industry has had to, to reshape itself. And because a lot of the trend lines in our economy have accelerated around automation, digital technology, you know, jobs are looking very different on the other side of this thing than they did going in. We've got to have a focus on reskilling. Of course, job creation is at the center of any recovery plan. And I think looking at where those jobs are going to get created and making them long term is important. And then our social safety net, I'll tell you, we'll talk about UI in a moment, but um, there's never been a better reminder of having a solid social safety net than we've seen. Uh, this last uh, this last year. And unemployment insurance has, has borne a great deal of that weight. Um, we need to reinvest there and in other places to make our state stronger. So um, with that, I'm pleased to turn it over to, to the team that I get fortunate to, to work with at our department. Um, really thrilled now to turn it over to our Deputy Commissioner for Workforce Development, Hamza Warfa, to walk through the work of the division that he oversees. So Hamza, over to you. Great, thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, Chair Noor, members of the committee, uh, thank you for inviting us to provide background uh, about our work. Uh, as the commissioner was presenting, I personally was reminded of why I took this job and why I decided to come to DEED, uh, which really to create change, to find new ways of serving more Minnesotans. 
And I think the impact of uh, the pandemic over the last, you know, uh, eight months, nine months, have really made this even more important. Uh, uh, before I go over the four subdivisions that come under the workforce development system, uh, I just want to highlight, you know, that in the equity goal, uh, OKR, uh, it was important for us to name systemic barrier, uh, systemic barriers, uh, because we really wanted to be clear about the root causes and systems that are in place, uh, which have excluded a lot of communities uh, from participating in our economy. Uh, those are, you know, uh, BIPOC communities, uh, people with disabilities, women, uh, others who couldn't really participate fully in our education, training, workforce, economic development, uh, generational wealth building, and more. Uh, so most of our work really focuses on, uh, especially under this division, uh, our work is about removing barriers. Uh, and so I'm excited to share with you the four uh, divisions here, uh, what I would call signature programs under the uh, workforce development system. Uh, next slide, if you can, uh, yep. So the, the first one I'd like to go over, as the commissioner mentioned, you know, employment and training program. Uh, it's a significant program we have. All of our training programs, whether within the state or the federal, we get about 300, 350 million from the federal government. All are housed under the employment uh, training program. And a uh, number of programs in the interest of time, I will not spend a lot of time on each of the programs, but just to highlight you, uh, we have employment uh, services, a laid off workers, uh, dislocated worker program. Uh, we're very fortunate to be the only state that also has a state dislocated worker in the entire country. Uh, so workers who lost their jobs through no fault of their own can receive assistance to find a new career. Uh, so the dislocated worker program is jointly, you know, uh, administered with the support of the federal funding and the state one. Uh, in this session, you will see uh, ideas to modernize uh, the Workforce Development Fund and other, you know, the uh, dislocated worker program uh, that we will present uh, in future. We also have an adult training program. Some of you are very familiar with, you know, the uh, P2P Pathways to Prosperity program is a signature under this uh, area. We also have youth and employment uh, training programs. You know, and those eligible for these services are mostly low-income families, those who have uh, severe barriers to employment, uh, who are represented in our workforce system, uh, and this is also jointly funded with some federal funding. Uh, some of the uh, key programs under the youth employment training are Youth Build, uh, which you know creates uh, over the construction career pathways uh, for at-risk you know youth or opportunity youth. Uh, we also have uh, Minnesota Youth uh, at, uh, Work Competitive Grants. Thank you for the investment from uh, this biennial. Uh, this program serves, you know, uh, disadvantaged youth aged of 14 to 24, with a special consideration to uh, youth from communities of color and those with disabilities. Uh, so it's a program that has really uh, significant impact on people that are looking for uh, opportunities, you know, for career pathways and uh, ways to build, you know, family sustaining wages uh, in the future. Uh, the other state funded program I will quickly mention is the Minnesota, Minnesota Youth Program, which provides uh, summer and year round employment uh, and training services uh, to low income uh, young, you know, uh, youth 14 to 24. So that's really uh, kind of some areas, but there's a number of other programs that come under employment training programs. Uh, in the next slide, you will see uh, Career Force, which delivers, you know, uh, joint services. Uh, it's kind of our wor workforce uh, system. Uh, we work closely with our 16 workforce uh, development areas. We work with our non-profit non providers. Uh, so it's kind of uh, it speaks to what the commissioner uh, was speaking about, you know, the the cross-sectoral approach to address the ch workforce challenge that we have in the state. So under Career Force, uh, we have veterans employment services, which gives priority services to qualified uh, military veterans and assists them with uh, connecting to employers and helping with the recruitment, you know, supply and demand. We also have employment services unit, which oversees the administration of the uh, federal Wagner-Pfizer funding. 
uh, and it delivers services to career seekers uh, and employers. Uh, and over the last year, year and a half, uh, we have really uh, increased the number of employer engagements uh, to ensure that you know the system serves both job seekers and uh, employers. So careerforcemn.com is the website and uh, affiliated is minnesotaworks.net. Uh, so employers can uh, access talents. Uh, we can, uh, job seekers can also seek counseling services, resume building, uh, job search. Uh, and in this uh, under pandemic uh, period, we were able to pivot some of the services to provide uh, virtual services. Um, those included, you know, online uh, uh, digital workforce training under Coursera platform. It included, you know, uh, people who might have access to uh, digital, you know, accessibility. They were able to, you know, use uh, just really call, phone call. Uh, we provided uh, linguistic services to ensure that, you know, people with uh, different language, you know, have the uh, accessibility in the midst of the pandemic crisis. Uh, and then we also have a job services team uh, that does most of the counseling and you know some of the other key programs. We work closely with um, DHS under the uh, MFIP program. Uh, we also work with uh, other you know uh, interagency collaborations happen uh, with these teams' uh, efforts. Um, so we also have Career Force, what we call Career Force Help Desk and Employer Services Team especially dedicated to, you know, uh, focusing on industries in demand, working with, you know, we know some of our regions have specialty areas. So this team also ensures, you know, that uh, we work with employers, you know, they provide programs like the work opportunity tax credit, uh, bonding and uh, foreign labor certification programs and host of other uh, programs. Uh, and then the next slide, uh, you will see, uh, the government, uh, sorry, Governor's Workforce Development Board. Uh, this is the board mandated to oversee uh, the state plan uh, that we submit to the federal government under the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. So every two years, uh, we are uh, required to submit a plan uh, in consultation with uh, all of our stakeholders in the workforce space. Uh, led by our, you know, stay our system, uh, the workforce uh, development uh, system, uh, and so really, uh, labor, education, business, community-based organizations, uh, government, uh, county boards—they all uh, participate. And so, we're very, uh, we were excited to get an approval for our uh, two-year state plan uh, last July. Uh, so that. Uh, Governor's Workforce Board meets about four times a year. We also have task forces under each of the uh, committees to ensure that, you know, we are exploring ideas that uh, the, the board can address from a holistic standpoint. And the fourth area uh, is, uh, Commissioner Grove mentioned, you know, the Office of Economic Opportunity. Uh, some of you might recall this uh, office was, was established in 2016. Uh, under a different name, uh, and we have really revamped to ensure that, you know, uh, what use are the programs if we don't have authentic outreach to the communities that uh, would benefit from these services. So this office is about 70% external facing, where we connect with uh, communities every week. We provide opportunities to get feedback about our services, and, but also to promote our programs uh, to those who uh, can benefit from it. And then 30% of the, the remaining 30% of the office focus more internally driving our equity agenda. So these are the four areas uh, housed under the workforce development system. We are grateful to your partnership and leadership and look forward to uh, engaged collaboration in this session and beyond. Uh, so with that, I will turn over to uh, my colleague, uh, workforce, uh, sorry, economic development, uh, Kevin McKinnon. Thank you, uh, Hamsa. Uh, for the record, Kevin McKinnon, Deputy Commissioner of uh, Economic Development uh, here at the uh, We've obviously been um, uh, quite busy over the last nine months, which you'll hear about some of the programs uh, later, uh, but doing a lot, uh, obviously, from not only programmatic 
perspective, but also communication with communities and businesses all across the state. Um, generally, uh, as well, over the past nine months, uh, all of our programs have continued to see demand uh, as well. So it's been uh, an incredibly Deputy busy uh, nine months. Deputy Commissioner, can yes. I think you have, uh, uh, your, your system is lagging. Uh, there's a little bit of, uh, I don't know if it's on my side or, or your side too. I think that's right. Maybe maybe if we killed the video, it would help. I'm not sure. I can try that. All right, is that better? Much better, Deputy Commissioner Hanlon. Please proceed. Excellent. Apologies uh, for that. Uh, slide, please, uh, Darielle. Um, the uh, Economic Development uh, and Research Division is really composed of uh, four main uh, areas. Um, the Business and Community Development Division, which operates grants, loan, and uh, tax credit programs, uh, provides technical services to businesses and, and communities, uh, basically to support the creation, expansion, attraction, and retention of businesses across the state. Uh, our trade office plays an important role uh, in our economic development efforts by providing export assistance and training for businesses to develop uh, or increase their international customer base. Uh, and two other offices that I wanna mention um, here, uh, I won't be talking about them in the slides today, but I uh, just wanna mention our Office of Broadband Development, uh, mainly known for its border to border grant program uh, since 2014, we've had this office to coordinate public and private efforts to increase the availability, speed, and connectivity of broadband across the state. Uh, I think it's safe to say that over the last nine months, we know the importance of that, uh, much like uh, this uh, hearing today. Um, uh, anyway, this, this program has increased access to economic health and education opportunities statewide, which is obviously important uh, to economic development. Uh, and then the fourth division is our economic research area. Uh, this division is mainly funded by Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics to develop, refine, and publish uh, data on our labor market and our economy. This is the group that you most likely are familiar with that presents monthly unemployment rates, uh, but they do a lot of great work related to explaining economic impact and trends that serve uh, not only businesses and communities, but also job creation job seekers all across the state. So slide please, Dario. Um, so within the business and community development division, there are uh, four units that I'll uh, talk about here today. Um, the first is our business development area. This, uh, this group um, works with businesses and communities to access deed services and other resources to support uh, the creation, retention, expansion, and attraction of businesses in Minnesota. The staff are on the ground. They are based uh, in the regions with uh, which they work um, and uh, promote specific sectors where Minnesota has strength uh, and work with our communities to be prepared for economic development opportunities. Our workforce strategy consultants assist businesses in accessing deed workforce services uh, and also promoting job opportunities. They too are based uh, across the state uh, and work collaboratively with local partners and businesses to help build a pipeline of talent, obviously important to economic development. Uh, and also within this group is our Minnesota Job Skills Partnership Program, which pairs businesses with higher education institutions and provides grants to create and implement specific uh, training programs for incumbent and new uh, workers. Slide, please. Uh, our business finance office, this is the group that uh, provides uh, grants, loans, and tax credits through over 20 active uh, programs that we run. Uh, some of the more uh, well-known uh, programs that you may be familiar with, uh, the Minnesota Job Creation Fund, which is uh, provides performance-based awards to new and expanding businesses after they meet job creation and, and capital investment targets. Our Minnesota Investment Fund, which provides upfront, upfront financing uh, that targets job creation in industrial manufacturing and high-tech industries. 
our Emerging Entrepreneur Program, which provides loans targeted at Minnesota small businesses owned by women veterans, people with disabilities, and uh, people from communities of color or low-income individuals. Our Angel Tax Credit Program, which provides a 25% tax credit to investors who invest in emerging and small technology businesses. And uh, more recently, our Launch Minnesota Grants, which provide up to $35,000 for the most promising technology-based uh, startups. Slide, please. Speaking of uh, Launch Minnesota, this is a relatively new initiative that we started in the last biennium, uh, essentially to catalyze our statewide technology entrepreneurial ecosystem. It's really rooted in providing the education and connections needed to advance a business today. And as such, we've employed various organizations across the state to create hubs and networks uh, so that regardless of where you're located in the state, you have access to what you need to be successful. As a result, our education grants have helped create six hubs with more than 60 network partners all across the state. Much of these, uh, the training and activities have been online obviously over the past year, uh, but this initiative is really gaining momentum to energize communities all across the state. Almost 400 people have successfully completed our lean startup training, and we're in the process of creating more access to resources such as our mentors or experts to help individual businesses with their ideas. Slide, please. Uh, sticking with our small business area, um, we almost we we run two small offices as well that provide information and assistance to entrepreneurs and small businesses. The Small Business Assistance Office is the office that provides guidebooks and information for starting and managing a business. In addition, this office offers individual transactional advice via phone or email. More than 35,000 people use this service every year. DEED is also the host agency for the SBA's SBDC program, our Small Business Development Center program. This is a statewide network uh, that provide uh, professional expertise and guidance that every small business owner needs to flourish in today's competitive and changing business world. We partner with nine regional centers across the state, mainly at higher education institutions, to offer free consulting to startups, emerging uh, and growing small businesses. This is also the unit that provides a variety of competitive grant programs uh, for our nonprofits uh, to serve targeted populations with business development technical assistance. Uh, to increase our quality and quantity of childcare. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, our Launch Minnesota grants uh, that help our uh, communities be connected all across the state. Slide, please. The next area in the economic development um, group is our community fi finance group. Uh, we also know that to attract and keep businesses, jobs, and people, our communities need many things, that is sound housing, ample commercial and industrial property, water, solid infrastructure, and so on. To make these more affordable, we provide financial assistance to communities statewide for projects that help them stay vital and better position them for new economic growth. But some of our programs include infrastructure, mainly from bonding bills, uh, we provide financing for infrastructure projects to support business growth, such as water sewer lines and roads, transportation projects. These funds assist the communities with the cost of this infrastructure. Our Brownfield and Redevelopment Office provides funding for communities working with developers to clean up land and buildings and return them to productive use, thereby generating job opportunities and tax benefits for those communities. Our small cities group is a federal program from housing and development, a $16 million program basically to provide grants to non-entitlement areas across the state. These are the small cities that do not receive a direct uh, appropriation directly from HUD. Uh, this program works to rehabilitate commercial buildings and housing uh, in communities for low-income individuals. This group also does a lot of the special appropriations, um, uh, local projects, as you might know, from bonding bills. Um, I think we had about 50 last year uh, that this group manages along with the Destination Medical Center project in Rochester and the Regional Medical Exchange in Duluth. Slide, please. 
The last group is our uh, trade office and uh, trade has been and remains a critical part of our economic development uh, strategy at DEED, uh, promoting stability and growth through exports and working to attract international investment to Minnesota. The reason is simple, sales outside our borders are good for the economy. Uh, the MTO provides a broad range of programs and services uh, sponsors and coordinates trade missions and other outreach to foreign countries to showcase Minnesota and our businesses and organizes reverse trade missions to bring people from foreign countries to Minnesota to learn about opportunities that exist. Importantly, we provide counseling and assistance in accessing markets for our businesses. And we also provide some financial programs to make, help make those connections as well. Staff conduct group training sessions and also provide one-on-one -on -one counseling and serve hundreds of small and medium-sized businesses each year. This office also works with partners across the globe to open doors for Minnesota businesses and to identify investors who might consider a Minnesota location. So I know that was a, a quick overview of the economic development um, area. Um, but uh, as uh, Deputy Commissioner Warfa uh, mentioned, happy to uh, uh, work with you and answer questions and talk about uh, the uh, Economic Development and Research Division at, at DEED. I'd now uh, turn it over to my part, uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Blake Chafee uh, for Workforce Services. Uh, good afternoon. Chair and, and members, uh, my name is Blake Chafee, uh, Deputy Commissioner of the Workforce uh, Services uh, Division here at DEED. Um, so our team is comprised of uh, four teams, unemployment insurance, uh, vocational rehabilitation services, state services for the blind, and disability determination services. So on the whole, these programs uh, provide financial assistance to Minnesotans that have uh, lost their job uh, or cannot work. Um, and provide training, placement, uh, support, ongoing supports to Minnesotans with disabilities. Um, uh, incredibly uh, important work uh, for the economic success of the state and for us at the department. Um, the first of those teams, uh, as you'll uh, on the PowerPoint, uh, VOC Rehab Services. Um, they provide assessment, evaluation, counseling, training, a number of different services. Um, for Minnesotans with disabilities. So the, the first bullet there is, is uh, VOC Rehab, which we would call uh, the basic uh, VR program. So uh, geared towards um, helping people with disabilities to explore employment choices, uh, find and maintain a job, a career, uh, and advance their careers through uh, counseling, uh, education, and continued training. Um, we also provide pre-employment transition services. So this is aimed at students, at youth, um, with disabilities to help plan out their, their school, their post-secondary uh, and career opportunities. Um, one thing I think is important to, to share with uh, the committee and, and, and to share this afternoon, um, and uh, I think some folks uh, may be more familiar with VR uh, know this, uh, the program provides services to Minnesotans with disabilities in four distinct categories. Uh, category one being reserved for customers with uh, the most significant and complex disabilities. Uh, under federal law, if the program does not have uh, the resources to provide services to all applicants, we have to establish a priority of service. Um, as some folks are aware uh, of those four categories, uh, three of the four have uh, actually been closed since 2014. Um, really happy to share uh, with, the, with the committee today that as of uh, December, just the end of last year, uh, the program was able to, was able to excuse me, uh, open up service in categories two and three and clear our waiting list. So um, because of that, we expect to serve an additional uh, 2,000 up to 2,400 uh, Minnesotans with disabilities before the, before the end of the uh, fiscal year. So um, that's good news. Uh, I, I think we're, um, we're excited by that and, and looking forward to the ability to expand service to Minnesotans that um, need support and, and need help. Um, next on the list, uh, extended employment helps people with disabilities keep their jobs, advanced career through long-term supports. We do that through a, a network of 28 community providers. Uh, we also work with Centers for Independent Living. Uh, so we provide both state and federal funding uh, to the centers uh, who help Minnesotans with disabilities uh, really live, uh, function independently in the home, um, at work, uh, and you know, on the job uh, in their community. Um, 
individual placement and supports. Uh, IPS uh, assists people with uh, mental illness to achieve uh, steady employment outcomes in, a, in a setting, an integrated setting. Um, the program provides a, a wide range of employment services uh, and supports. Um, last on uh, the list, uh, deaf, deaf, blind, hard of hearing. Uh, these are grants to community partners uh, that provide long-term employment support for persons uh, who are deaf, deaf, blind, or hard of hearing. Um, a couple of the, just by the numbers uh, for the program, uh, fiscal year 20, about 5,700 enrollments. Uh, we have 15,000 ongoing program participants and we exited uh, just about 2,300 uh, into empl employment plans uh, or uh, with a job. Uh, extended employment, uh, about 3,100 uh, customers served, uh, which amounts to just about $28 million uh, in the Minnesota economy. Um, the next program in workforce services is state services for the blind. Uh, we assist Minnesotans who are blind, deaf blind, uh, losing vision or that have a, a disability that um, makes it difficult for them to read print. Um, there are a couple main components to SSB3, uh, Workforce Development, Senior Services, and then our Communication Center. Um, that Workforce Development team is actually broken up into two parts. We have a, a voc rehab program that works with individuals, uh, with students on skills, training, um, and technology needs, uh, helping them to, to be part of the workforce. Um, we have employment specialists and assistive technologists that actually work with businesses uh, to assist them in recruitment, uh, employee retention, to work with employers on um, accommodations. So some, some really important work. Um, second uh, part of workforce development is our business enterprise program. So we provide vending businesses, uh, business opportunities, I'm sorry, for blind, visually impaired, uh, and deafblind entrepreneurs. Uh, so these vending businesses, which I'm sure many of you in the committee uh, have seen are, are within state and federal buildings. We have 158 locations actually uh, throughout the state, across the state. Um, right now we have 28 entrepreneurs and uh, their programs generate, or their uh, uh, vending businesses, I'm sorry, uh, generate about 5.7 million uh, in annual sales. So a really, um, a really important uh, program for, for our entrepreneurs. Uh, our senior services team uh, really works with customers to, to help them meet the challenge of vision, vision loss with, um, you know, support and service that's really tailored to their needs. Um, so these services, uh, kind of on a broad range, uh, anything from maybe managing household activities, um, things like training to use a white cane, um, how to continue to access uh, technology up to more complex uh, interdependent skills. Um, a lot of the folks that we work with uh, do have an age-related macular degeneration, uh, glaucoma, um, other uh, vision-related conditions that are often a, a part of aging. Um, the final program within SSB, uh, our communication center. Uh, the communication center provides information, um, any, just about anything you can think of, newspapers, books, magazines, um, an array of materials through Braille, audiobooks, um, some podcasts, large print. Um, we also provide uh, Braille materials for Minnesota's uh, K through 12 school kids, and we, and we do the same uh, for higher education students. Uh, our uh, reading service, the Radio Talking Book, uh, broadcasts books, news, magazines, daily newspapers. Um, radio Talking Book is, is uh, really a gem, uh, started in 1969 first of its kind uh, service in, in um, the United States, North America, across the world, uh, something that is an important part of the work that we do in providing accessible information and something that um, we're, we're just really proud of. Um, so uh, please check that out uh, if you get a chance. Um, move on to uh, something that uh, I know, uh, I think all of us have heard a lot about uh, in the last year, in the last 10 months is unemployment insurance. Uh, we have been invited back to take a deep dive uh, next week, so I'm going to do kind of just a high-level overview. Um, but uh, uh, basically, unemployment insurance is a program that provides temporary uh, partial wage replacement to workers who have become unemployed uh, through no fault of their own. It's an eligibility-based program, generally pays uh, up to 50% of the average weekly wage uh, for 26 weeks. That's subject to a, a state a weekly maximum, which in Minnesota is about $740. Um, 
Uh, we work very closely with our colleagues in Career Force, with uh, Deputy Commissioner Warfa's team, uh, to ensure that uh, workers that have been uh, separated from their job have, a, have a, a, a successful path back into the workforce. So that's really an important relationship uh, inside of DEED on behalf of, of our customers. The last thing I would say is Minnesota regularly ranks in the top five states uh, as it relates to running this program in, in all federal performance standards. Um, I think we're really lucky in, in Minnesota to have one of the best, if not the best, UI programs um, in the country. Uh, we'll certainly talk more about this later, but it has been a, a, a trying and busy year for the team. I'm incredibly proud of, of the work that they've done on behalf of Minnesotans, helping them weather the pandemic. We've paid out just about $9.6 billion uh, since uh, March compared to about 800 million last year. So it just gives you a little bit of the idea of the volume uh, that we've worked with. Um, uh, kind of last, and there's not a slide for it, is disability uh, determination services. Um, our workforce services team also includes DDS, it's a federal program. Uh, it is funded 100% by the Social Security Administration. Um, as the name would suggest, the DDS team uh, adjudicates applications for Social Security disability uh, on behalf of SSA. Um, generally, we uh, receive process uh, about 45 to 50,000 uh, determinations a year. So, um, like I said, uh, you know, federally funded um, uh, SSA kind of provides and and directs a lot of what they do day to day in terms of the incoming uh, caseload, um, but also a, a, an important part of, of the deed team and ultimately the, the suite of services and, and the things that we provide um, for, uh, for Minnesotans. So um, appreciate the chance to, uh, to share a little bit uh, with you about a workforce services team and, uh, and I'm happy to pass it to my colleague, uh, Evan Rowe. Thanks, Blake. Um... Mr. Chair, uh, committee members, uh, it's nice to see you all. Um, my name is Evan Rowe. I am the Assistant Commissioner for Operations at DEED, and I'm uh, really excited to be here today. I just have one slide to show you all, um, and that's just a quick uh, overview of the general support services area uh, here at DEED. Um, you know, we're the, we're the team that helps DEED run and make, uh, make sure that we're providing really great services to both our internal and external customers across the agency and across the state. Uh, just really quick, uh, General Support Services comprises the Commissioner's Office, uh, the Communications Office, which has both an external facing communications component as well as an internal facing communications element, our Office of Diversity and Equal Opportunity, which ensures that we are uh, not just complying but excelling uh, in regards to our obligations around equal opportunity and our diversity goals as a state government, our Office of General Counsel for all legal needs, our administrative and financial services group, which does everything from procurement to finance, um, to uh, real estate management and uh, other related services, human resources, um, our performance and technical management team, which um, ma helps manage our group, our relationship with Minute, as well as a variety of other services and systems and performance management for a variety of our programs. And we also are the liaisons with our uh, peers and counterparts at Minute um, to ensure that all the various technologies, which again, our internal and external customers use are uh, running smoothly and well. Um, with that, I'll turn it back over to Commissioner Grove. Thank you. Great, thanks Mr. Commissioner. And uh, we've been sharing a lot here. So we wanna get to questions as soon as possible. We did just wanna take a moment to talk about our, our response to COVID. 19 is obviously that is a topic on everyone's mind and we'll just run through a few of the programs that we have built and collaborated with on all of you and then eager Mr. Chair to get to questions from the committee. So, um, you know, I think we talked about UI a moment ago, but it's just helpful to give this give a perspective here over nine and a half billion dollars into the pockets of Minnesotans since this all began through our state's UI system that's 23 million actual payments. We used to send checks out in the mail. We don't do that anymore. We just go straight to bank accounts. But when we did, they were you know, seven inches or so long. And if you add all the checks up that we have mailed, uh, mailed as it were this year, it'd be about 3000 miles worth of payments. It's just a lot of money and a lot of people, 815,000 individuals have at least received at least one payment this year. And obviously the vast majority of these people never expected in a million years that when 2020 began, they'd be receiving unemployment insurance. So it has been a gargantuan uh, effort to help uh, folks across the state receive payments. Um, and it's one that we will continue into this year. Right now, we're experiencing about 380,000 weekly benefit requests for unemployment insurance 
from Minnesota workers. And it's our top goal to make sure people get paid fast, efficiently, and fairly. Um, and that we're transparent and open about communication. And you've all helped us do that throughout this last year. Diving into some of the, um, well, this is, this is just a quick graph that kind of makes the point that I just did that to put it in perspective, this is a jump that we have not seen since the likes of, of really any recession in history. We're back now down to levels that we were at sort of at the peak of previous recessions. But that initial jump in April was an extraordinary lift. And uh, I do just want to give a shout out to our unemployment insurance team for the, the work that they did to make this possible. We are blessed in the state to have one of the, the strongest unemployment insurance systems uh, in the country. So we've also, of course, been helping small businesses uh, through the leadership you've all provided on building some great programs, an emergency loan program that brought about $30 million of money uh, from the state budget into small businesses across the state. These are 50% forgivable loans. Um, we also did a loan guarantee program that helped to get banks involved more frequently by guaranteeing about 80% of the principal that would come from those loans uh, backed up by the government, a uh, max of $200,000 loans there. Um, and then we did a CARES Act focused uh, grant round of about $72.5 million that we worked on extensively in a special session uh, earlier uh, in the summer that brought CARES Act funding to a whole host of businesses across the state with specific carve outs for businesses that have faced some of the steepest challenges, whether they be uh, smaller businesses, businesses owned by people of color uh, or cultural malls. Uh, this was a critical step in helping small businesses weather some of the toughest months of this pandemic. Um, and really a debt of gratitude to our visit of Noor and, and Stevenson and Mahoney who are key uh, com contributors to that legislation. And then of course, as I mentioned at the top of this conversation, the relief package from last December, $216 million. This is really an unprecedented aid package for state businesses broken into three chunks, um, revenue for um, our restaurants, bowling alleys uh, and bars and breweries and wineries through a Department of Revenue program is around $80, $88 million of that bill, a movie theater and convention center uh, grant program that DEED is running um, to help movie theaters and convention centers weather this pandemic, um, and then a, a lot of money for, uh, for counties, um, it, which are given a lot of flexibility really to counties to make some of those decisions. Um, we'll get a little bit more deeply into the movie theater and convention center grant program just because those are the ones that DEED runs. Uh, for the movie uh, theater program, this is focused on obviously our state's movie theaters focused by screen uh, numbers of screens. Um, you have to have had at least $15,000 in ticket sales in the last year and a 30% drop in revenue this year compared to last. Um, and you have to have a physical location here in Minnesota and any money that we give to those theaters has to be spent on, on theaters uh, here in, uh, in, in Minnesota. So for those national chains, this isn't money to, to send to, to LA or New York, it's money to be spent right here in Minnesota. And then the convention center grant program is the next one. This is just focused on these, these large regional convention center, centers that are really economic drivers for their region, right? Folks come to convention, they spend a lot of money with the businesses around those centers. And they've of course had a huge amount of suffering this year, given the fact that large gatherings are about the last thing that you can do in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, and so we are focused on really the largest regional convention centers here. These are convention centers that seat at least uh, 1,500 or more, uh, and the money here can be up to $500,000 total in grants. And again, some of those same restrictions apply in terms of the amount of revenue drop uh, and, um, and economic impact there. So those programs are both open. They'll be open through January 29th and happy to answer further questions on either of those. And then lastly, the, the county relief grants, these are of course administered by the county themselves. This is the larger, largest bucket of money from that program. Um, and these go directly to counties um, to really have as much flexibility as they need to distribute money to businesses uh, who need it. Um, those businesses can be businesses who've also gotten money from the revenue bucket of the program. Uh, they can be businesses that are directly or even indirectly affected by executive orders and the challenges that we've faced. And so really wanted to, to work closely with the Association of Minnesota Counties and Minnesota's 87 counties to really get that program right. Um, and so uh, that aid package is something that we're very much focused on as a huge priority as this year uh, begins. Um, and again, just a big thanks to, to Representative Noor and Representative Baker in particular, who are uh, really chief negotiators uh, with us in that process earlier this year. So I will stop there. We're eager to hear your questions. Thanks for the chance to come talk to you. We're looking forward to a good session ahead. And Mr. Chair, uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Grove. I appreciate uh, the work that your department and also your staff and 
everybody has been doing. This has been a challenging uh, process. Uh, it's as if we haven't had even a break from the previous session. So this is just a continuity of the work that we're doing. Uh, members, uh, I will encourage you to ask questions by raising your hand using the uh, raise hand uh, function and you will be recognized based on who is asking. So, uh, and then I just wanted to plug in that Hennepin County, the county resources that the commissioner just mentioned, the application due date is tomorrow. So if you live in Hennepin County, every county is unique. They know their, uh, their constituents, they know what the needs are. So what I would like to encourage is for individuals to go to their county and apply for those programs. Uh, and Hennepin County, the deadline for the application for the COVID relief is tomorrow. Uh, having said that, uh, I know I have many questions. I'd like to let uh, my colleagues ask those questions first. Uh, our lead, uh, Republican lead, uh, Representative Hamilton has got his hand up. Please uh, uh, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, Commissioner, thank you for the conversation we had earlier. Greatly appreciated. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have three topics or three questions. Uh, the first one, uh, Commissioner, I have a passion for people with disabilities. And through this uh, struggle with COVID, our development achievement centers, DACs, and communities in which I represent have uh, really been impacted in a negative way. And, um, and subsequently, people with disabilities have found themselves unemployed. Um, could you just uh, once again briefly touch on how we're going to uh, address that and get those people back to work? Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. Hamilton, it, it's a great uh, question and it's something that's very important to us as well. Uh, you know, stepping back for a minute and just looking at, at, at the trend lines here, which I'm sure you, you know well, we have seen in the last five years a huge uh, increase in the labor force participation of people with disabilities. And I think an increased willingness of employers to hire people with disabilities because they bring skills that uh, uh, folks without disabilities don't have. Um, uh, strong loyalties, real commitment to, to focus, um, abilities to problem solve and think outside the box because that's what somebody with disabilities has to do every single day of their lives. So. We have really lifted up um, that part of this agency's work a lot over the last year and a half and have uh, held several forums and roundtables on it. I'll say specifically as it relates to our VRS department uh, and Deputy Commissioner Chafee can chime in here if he has more to add to too. Um, this is an area where in-person service matters more than virtual service. And it's been one of the challenges of this pandemic, right? This virtual stuff works for most people. It may not be ideal, but it works. There are a whole host of Minnesotans who have disabilities for whom this doesn't really work. And, we consistently reevaluate, you know, can we get into more in-person services? Can we bring people, you know, into our career force centers in a way where everyone, which everyone is safe? I can just tell you candidly, we were very close to doing that before the surge in the fall. And now that things have calmed down a bit, that's a, a conversation we are re-engaging in uh, very directly because, you know, look, I come from technology. I, I, I live and breathe using these tools, but I am no fool to the fact that this doesn't work in a lot of situations. And so um, I think in-person service really matter. I do think getting uh, more categories of our, of our people with disabilities into the ERS program by getting them off the wait list has been a huge efficiency win for that department. Um, but we look forward to work with you on this because I think there's ways that we can improve it even further. And you as, as a lifelong advocate for this and someone who's been a real leader here, I think can help us a lot. So I appreciate you raising this. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, uh, the second Thank question. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Two more questions. My second question, it was brought up about infrastructure, uh, the need for in infrastructure for businesses. And I represent a very rural area. And this is one of the reasons why I ran. Um, we have a highway that runs right through the heart of District 22B, Highway 60. That highway was scheduled to be completed in 1973. And all the money dried up and came to the metro area. And so that was a big motivation for me to run for office. In 2008, I voted to override Governor Plenty's veto. We were able to secure $223 million, and finally we got that road completed. The same thing is water. With a land of 10,000 lakes, in our area, we have a shortage of water. We worked directly with Governor Dayton, secured $70 million to get rural water infrastructure down there in southwestern Minnesota. And so we need to make sure with D that we're working with the other departments and entities to make sure that rural Minnesota isn't left behind. And we're addressing roads, 
and uh, uh, water and sewer and some of those things. So I don't know, Commissioner, if you want to comment on that. Well, I think it's really well said, and I think it, it is in many ways particularly important in greater Minnesota, and the legislature consistently, you know, brings quotas and carve outs for greater Minnesota percentages in terms of the, the program spend to our agency, which we're eager uh, to enact. You know, one area that I didn't mention in the overview of the agency is that we also uh, oversee the, the quasi independent public facilities authority that puts out millions of dollars every year into to water and infrastructure projects. So we work very closely with, uh, with Director uh, Freeman and his team, um, which is a critical piece of this. And, and we also have some programs with, with MnDOT on, um, on transportation projects that lead to economic development. So um, we were glad to see in the bonding bill that came through some more money for the business development uh, uh, bonding programs that we have at DEED, BDPI and others. Um, many of those are just significant specifically for greater Minnesota, but you're right. I mean, this is about economic development. It's also about jobs. You know, this is a moment when good jobs can come from these bonding projects. And so we'd love to, to continue that conversation this session. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, my last question is that uh, businesses can handle a lot, but what they can't handle or really struggling is with the uncertainty. And uh, Commissioner, if you can uh, take the message back to the governor, is um, we need to make sure that we have more certainty or additional timelines or uh, time to plan in the event that there are these shutdowns, et cetera. And so Commissioner, um, I don't know if you have a crystal ball um, or anything like that. If you can uh, give us any type of idea where we're gonna go from here as far as getting businesses reopened and getting people back to work. Commissioner Grove. Mr. Chair, Representative Hamilton, it's, it's a great question. And many of you may have caught the governor last night with, with Doug Loon at the Minnesota Chamber event in which he was clear in saying the last thing he wants to do is dial back any further. And the thing he most wants to do is dial forward more. It has been the most vexing and difficult challenge for businesses this year is that uncertainty and, and the back and forth and the challenges and, and that lead time. And so message received. I think it's, I'm glad you're raising it here. Businesses raise it to us all the time. Um, this pandemic has been anything if, if not unpredictable, um, but we have to do the best thing we can to give businesses as much assurance as we can. They're already dealing with unpredictable levels of consumer confidence. Anything government can do to be more consistent and give more lead time is important. So we, we will strive for that. And we ask that you keep pushing us to strive for it. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Representative Hamilton, for the questions. I know we, we have to look into how to uh, address the pandemic at the same time, taking care of individuals for their lives and livelihood. So those are great questions. Uh, the next person in, uh, is Representative Cagle. Thank you, Mr. Chair and um, Commissioner. This kind of goes back to some of the COVID recovery stuff that we um, just covered and um, have a unique situation with the National Sports Center in my district. And so I was curious, I know I had encouraged them to kind of um, seek some of the assistance under the um, convention center piece. And so I was just wondering if that was the appropriate place for them to seek assistance and if they were able to um, access some of that. Mr. Chair, Representative Cagle, it, it's a great question. Um, and we can, I can turn over to Deputy Commissioner McKinnon if we want to get into some of the details of that program. But, you know, it, it was very much as the legislature read it, wrote it about these kind of uh, uh, neutral meeting spaces for which any type of meeting can, can take place uh, versus stadiums or, uh, or, or concerts or theater halls or, or centers that are sort of part of other mixed businesses like malls and, and things like that. So, you know, I think that it's, it's more likely than not that the, the National Sports Center, which is truly one of the treasures of our state, it is better uh, focused on the county bucket um, because of its unique stature. I think the convention center program is really narrow. Our estimate is, is there's around 10 or so in the state that, are, that qualify for that convention center program. And the reason to carve them out is just that if there's enough things that look alike, then the state can move quickly to get money out in a way that might uh, be faster than counties. Um, but I'm glad you raised it. Um, and, I, and I hope that they uh, apply for, for the county program. Deputy Commissioner McKinnon, did you have anything to add to that? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Any further questions, uh, Representative Kegel? Uh, so uh, the next person is Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Um, I guess mine aren't more so questions. I would just, I don't know, Commissioner Grove, if you know or not, that I do own a small bar and a, a small cafe. Um, so I just wanted to echo uh, Representative Hamilton's, you know, um, sentiment about the uncertainty. Um, I won't go into that. It, it's been tough on all of us. But I would like to pay uh, your agency uh, an, uh, a little bit of a, a that a boy. Uh, during this pandemic, my industry has been up and down. We've been shut, we've been closed. My employees have been out of work, working part-time, working full-time. Um, the unemployment insurance program has become, uh, you know, second nature to me in assisting my employees. And I will say that um, the transition from the overwhelming um, influx that you guys had and then moving till now has just been awesome. The, response, the, the ability for your people to communicate with my people and to get their questions answered and their needs met has just been wonderful. Now that's been my own personal experience, but I thought today's day and age, you deserved a pat on the back and your people deserve a pat on the back for the hard work they've been doing around that to help the people of Minnesota. And that's all that I have, Mr. Chair. I couldn't agree with you more, uh, Representative Frankie. Thank you so much uh, for that comment. I don't know if you wanted to respond back, uh, Commissioner Grove. Well, Mr. Chair, Representative Frankie, thanks. I, all credit goes to the team. And um, we know your employees have had a heck of a year and it, it's so stressful and every single claim matters. So uh, we appreciate your leadership too and just elevating their, their claims and, and um, the claims of your constituents because uh, this money is really keeping food on the table for so many families at a really difficult time. Uh, Commissioner Grove, I just wanted to clarify some few things. I know uh, you talked about the Department of Revenue uh, direct payments. I'm assuming those payments are already going out as we speak. Uh, is that correct, Commissioner? Mr. Chair, yes, that is correct. The uh, All qualifying businesses should have received a letter through the e-file system by December 31st. And I believe the Revenue Department sent out uh, the, the payments just yesterday um, and so it took take five to seven business days for it to hit the account, um, but that is moving forward. Um, I should say, and I'm sure Commissioner Doty can speak to this with a lot more specificity, but you know, there may be businesses who felt like uh, we should have a qualified and didn't, or we were under the wrong sort of NAICS code, and in other words, classified as a type of business that we didn't think we were. There will be a chance to, to raise your hand and let revenue know that. Uh, that'll be uh, more information on that in the coming days, but yeah, that, that bucket, as we all discussed in, in building that package, was really about speed. And so um, just a huge kudos to, to Commissioner Doty and his team who worked through every single day of the holiday season to get that program up and running. And uh, thankfully, those checks are now are now moving. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I see uh, Representative Baker. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And, and, and again, Commissioner Grove, thanks for all your work on this. We worked a lot on uh, a lot of issues here. And uh, something just came to my attention today, and I, I, uh, I know that Commissioner Doty from Revenue is not on the call with us today, but restaurants and bars now are at a real critical point where sales tax payments, when they closed on November 20th, are, uh, are due, and they sort of kind of held back on that. Can you speak to um, what the Department of Revenue or maybe the governor may be able to do to kind of help delay uh, or give some time for them, the restaurants, bars that are right now having to pay sales tax from monies right when they were shut down. Is there any kind of a window where we can allow them to not be penalized for the next uh, 30 to 60 days right now? Have you had any conversations with your colleague, Commissioner Doty, on giving us some time? I just got some uh, emails today that are due and we got some folks out there that are just opened you know, yesterday and uh, they don't have the money yet to pay that sales tax in November when they had to shut down. Any comments on those sort of deadlines right now that are facing these operators. Uh, Representative Baker, uh, I understand uh, Commissioner Grove is uh, representing the uh, Department of uh, Deed. Uh, I don't know if he can respond to a question that is being directed. Uh, go ahead, Commissioner Grove. Well, Mr. Chair, President Baker, you're right. Commissioner Doty could certainly go into more detail here, but obviously he and I are talking every day and this issue has come up again and again, Representative Baker, so I'm glad you raised it here. Individual organizations who need deferral of those payments should just call revenue ASAP. The, the ability to defer those payments still does exist. 
it's not being proactively deferred. You got to raise your hand for it. But I would instruct any business who who needs that deferral, given these shutdowns, to to go contact Revenue directly. I think they have a whole page in their website, as I recall, that walks through this. So again, more detail from Robert and his great team. But uh, it is important, and I'm glad you you raise it here for awareness. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Just as you as you represent Speak for Businesses, I wanted to make sure you had that pipeline and that relationship. So I will tell them to reach out to Commissioner Doherty. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Baker. Uh, I see uh, Representative uh, Davni. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, my question, I believe, is for Assistant Commissioner Warfa. Uh, a lot of the conversation uh, this afternoon here has focused on uh, business supports, and that's that's uh, as it should be. We've done a lot of work around that, uh, bipartisanly led by Chair Noor, but. Uh, Assistant Commissioner Warfa, an unemployment question. Um, I'm hearing, and I know a number of my colleagues are hearing as well, from restaurant workers who are long-term unemployed, who mid-March of 2020, they lost their jobs when the restaurant closed and have not been able to secure employment at that restaurant or at any other restaurant since, and are telling us that they lost a week of benefits the week of December 20th. And they're not understanding how between the extension that we passed and was signed into law by the governor and the extension that President Trump signed, admittedly late, but those two extensions they thought would cover them. And I'm wondering if you can explain to, to members, are they not getting that coverage? Because obviously these are folks who may not have made a whole lot of money to begin with and unemployment, uh, we seem to like to keep our unemployed people poor and the unemployment benefits in Minnesota uh, don't provide a, a, an excessive benefit level. Uh, and so missing a week is, is serious business for folks. Can you help me better understand the situation, please, sir? Yeah, Chair Noor, uh, Representative Devin, I, uh, my colleague uh, Blake Shafi uh, mm. oversees unemployment, so he will respond to the specific question. But I'd like to take advantage of this now to say that, you know, we know the service industry is an uh, industry that has been significantly impacted uh, by COVID. And we know some of the jobs might never come back. Uh, I think most of them will come back, but as it is on, on every state, a lot of jobs, you know, some place workers might need to think about, you know, upscaling or reskilling, utilizing their existing skills for another job or another sector. So we are leading a rescaling initiative in which we are uh, working with, you know, displaced workers uh, by providing multiple avenues to either get immediate training or immediate job that requires, you know, um, less new training and more of using existing skill sets. Uh, and so we recognize this is going to require a multi-pronged approach uh, to really help, you know, displaced workers. But to your specific question, I'd like to invite uh, my colleague, uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, Blake. Deputy Commissioner Shafi. Uh, uh, Chair, uh, Representative Dabney, uh, that's, a, that's a, an excellent question and uh, to to put a fine point on it, there were a, a, a universe of folks that did miss uh, a week or two potentially of payment between uh, the CARES Act uh, and the um, uh, and the stimulus bill. Um, when the stimulus was signed by the president, it became effective for the week of 1227 for December 27th. Uh, and then folks were able to request that payment uh, starting Sunday, the 3rd of January. Depending on when an individual applicant started on benefits, so going way back to March, right, uh, 26 weeks of a standard benefit, uh, 13 of an extension. Um, some folks were on extended benefits, um, but there was a group of, uh, of applicants that did exhaust uh, before that week of the 27th. Um, and some of them missed uh, potentially one or two weeks. Uh, there was no ability within the stimulus to go back retroactive farther than the 27th. Um, that's a universe that, and I apologize, um, there was a time when I could have told you exactly how many folks it was. I just don't have that in front of me right now. Um, uh, that is a universe of applicants that, that we did identify and we communicated with them directly, um, especially when you consider 
you know, we were able to thankfully move very quickly to stand up the, the programs within the new stimulus. Uh, so we did reach out to those folks. And, and despite the fact that, you know, some of them missed one, potentially two weeks, uh, they did become eligible again uh, under the stimulus. So we were able to reach out to them directly and say, hey, uh, go back into your, you know, go back into your account. There are benefits available now. But um, that is, uh, uh, Representative, that is correct. There were some folks that um, it, that did miss potentially a, a week or two of benefits in the interim between exhausting benefits under the CARES Act and the stimulus uh, starting that week of the 27th. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. And, and Mr. Chaffee, thank you for that. And, and I, any critique you may have picked up was not a, uh, in my voice or comments, was not a critique of the agency or of, of your work, but uh, concern for my constituents who uh, are in a difficult position and found themselves uh, in a gap. Uh, and then a, a larger question about uh, decades of decisions around unemployment and how robust, uh, how sustaining unemployment benefits should be uh, or not. So thank you for the information. I'll try to carry that back uh, to my constituents. Uh, thank, thank you, you Chair. Chair. Thank, thank you, Chair Daveny. Uh, the next person uh, is Representative Juggins. Tony Juggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner Grove, first of all, I wanna thank you uh, for your accessibility throughout this whole pandemic. I'm sure when you took this job, uh, growing jobs in Minnesota is what you were looking forward to, not dealing with a pandemic. Uh, but throughout this, you personally have been um, accessible to me and to my constituents and so of your staff, when, whether it's uh, unemployment issues or, or questions, and I appreciate that. So I just, I just wanna say thank you. Uh, with respect to the, uh, the uh, Department of Revenue payments that are going out, you know, a lot of us reached out to our counties and urge them when they got to their bucket to distribute the, the, the money to the businesses in our counties uh, to take into consideration those that might not have qualified during the first bucket because of the criteria of second and third quarter uh, um, reduction in business or loss of 30% or more. Uh, but unfortunately, they don't know who those businesses are because that data is not being made available. Can you help me understand a little bit about the, the criteria for not making, and we don't need to see people's tax returns, but a list of businesses in my district would tell me who's getting the, the first bucket of money from DOR, and more importantly, who's not. Um, is that something that we need to deal with legislatively to make that happen, or, or can you tell us a little bit more about the thought process there, please? Commissioner Grove, I know we had extensive discussion on this issue, but please uh, proceed. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair, Representative Jurgens. Um, it's a great question because it, it, from a pure perspective of running an efficient program, it makes good sense that you would just share data and move and go. Um, but the state statutes that we operate under, that the legislature has designed, um, do not allow that kind of data sharing. And you know, I, I what didn't write them, wasn't a part of them. We run an agency based on them. But if I was to intuit some of the reasons why is that sharing that information publicly of an individual business's revenue loss may not be palatable to, to some businesses. And I think um, certainly the legislature could move forward with a legislative fix if you felt making that data more transparent would be in the best interest of everyone involved. But I think the reason that that, that exists is a difference is simply that um, that kind of information starts to share in, you know, um, news about businesses that at a broad scale, some businesses might not want to be in, in public. Um, but again, this is something that we just don't have the ability to do um, with the current laws that govern uh, revenue or the Department of Employment and Economic Development. What we've tried to do as a fix is work very closely with, with counties on their programs to include self-attestation in the application process so that they can signal if they've gotten a grant or not. It's part of why we wanted to move quick on these revenue grants this week so that businesses will know and then they can tell counties the truth about whether or not they've gotten a grant or not. Um, there's also something called the Form 165R, I think, that Revenue has, and, and Commissioner Doty could speak more to this, um, that outlines um, some more data permission issues that an individual organization could fill out. But I hear your concern. Um, it's one of those things where there's kind of uh, perspectives on both sides of it, but as it relates to our ability to do anything on the data sharing right now, uh, the Department of Revenue is, is bound back by that, that statute. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. I know we are running out of time. We will definitely have more questions uh, uh, in the coming days and uh, 
we will definitely uh, try to address how we can help those businesses uh, in the process. So members, as a reminder, uh, we do not have a meeting next Monday uh, in observance of uh, Rev Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s holiday. Our next meeting will be Wednesday, January 20th. Uh, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll see if uh, we can uh, get more questions uh, for the uh, UI and employment benefits, uh, because I know most of you have asked that question. Uh, having said that, uh, I don't see any other agenda items uh, for today. And it's the hour, the time that has come. So I just wanted to say thank you to the commissioner and his staff uh, for their presentation. Uh, if you intend to connect with the department, please feel free. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm sure you will get uh, those questions answered. Having said that, uh, I would like to say the meeting is adjourned for today. Thank you so much, members. Mm -hmm.